everyone and thank you for attending tonight's FAPS final accounts preparation revision session tonight we're going to look at incomplete records um, and I don't know about you this was one of those topics that for a long time I just thought it was just so weird and mysterious I'd never be able to make sense of it and yet with a couple of the right techniques and a little bit of common sense it actually does become perfectly doable perfectly reasonable uh, two main areas that we look at we use control accounts it's a case of what does it need to make it balance that's our missing figure alternatively we use markups or margins that's where we're given a percentage uh, profit figure and we're given we use that to to convert sales into cost of sales and so on so we're going to look at examples of both and it's just done to our next page there we are so task six is about preparing accounting records from incomplete information anybody who's worked in practice uh, has seen plenty of cardboard boxes full of all manner of rubbish um, and not a full set quite often worth 12 marks so 15 minutes to complete it in this task, you need to be able to calculate missing figures relating to income, expenses, assets, liabilities, and capital it can be any of these. It could be using day books, the cash book, or control accounts. Now, first thought with control accounts, the first thing you have to know is what goes in each control account and where it goes. So the two main ones I'm just thinking about here are our sales ledger control, which we now have to call receivables control uh, and our purchase ledger or payables control. Sales ledger control, that's how much money people owe us. Money people owe us is of course an asset and an asset has a debit balance. So the first thing that will be in the sales ledger control, the receivables control, will be our opening balance. Things that increase the amount customers owe, and remember it's only credit customers that are receivables. Cash customers have to be dealt with separately. Be careful of that. So credit sales will increase the amount that is owing. On the other hand, things that reduce the amount owing all go on the other side so let's just summarize that so all, all the increased items are debits the reduced items are all credits the most obvious one is a payment somebody pays the bill they don't owe us anymore the other thing the other way you can reduce what you owe if you're a customer is you can send stuff back so sales returns um, if we want people to pay early, we might offer to allow them a discount. I'll put returns in Woods for sales returns. Discount allowed. Um, and sadly, the other thing that causes us to reduce the amount um, that we expect to receive is if we had to write off a bad debt which we now call an irrecoverable debt just to make it harder for the likes of me to say it day in day out so that's how the receivables total control works final figure in the mix is of course we start at the start of the month there's an amount owing there will be an amount owing at the end of the month and so between those two sides, one side will be greater than the other. Oh, contra. Uh, wow, somebody's on the ball. Very good. I've got to move them down, haven't I? Wow. I like it. I like it. Yep. Okay. Contra. So all items that reduce. And wherever we have to put the balancing figure, is our missing in fact i should probably say one of these items will be the item we're looking for 
probably it'll be sales that we're looking for or it could be if the bank records have all gone astray it could be we're looking for the payment received so whichever of those is missing because we must of course have the same totals so whichever's missing we add in and hey presto that's what we're after very similarly the payables control is of course a liability apologies i haven't silenced that and therefore has a credit balance so in this case the opening balance is going to be on the credit side any credit purchases will go on the credit side and very similar to before payments reduce the balance they go in as debits returns outwards discounts received we can't really put <laughs> bad debts It'd be nice if we could make our our provision for um, unpaid payables but we're not allowed to do that but contras of course equally apply same effect um and our closing balance will go in on that side ready to be a credit in the next period and again the difference between the two one of these figures will be the missing figure that we are looking for whatever it takes to make it balance is the one we put in so it's same process but this time the debits all reduce and the credits all increase and we will have a go at a task of doing this in a minute now the next technique we use if it's not to do with the missing figure from a control account we use markups and margins and the magic number that unlocks all of these is the hundred percent because one of either the sales or the cost will be the hundred in the case of a profit margin our margin is a percentage of the sales figure if we sell for 100 pounds and our margin is 20 percent we're making 20 pounds in case of a profit markup the profit is calculated as a percentage of the cost so let's do an example we use the same template this little table here at the top we have price or revenue whichever in the middle we have profit and at the bottom we have cost and if it's a markup the cost is a hundred percent so let's say we are told um let's say we're told we have a markup of 40 percent we know automatically because our profit is added to our cost our selling price is 140 percent of the cost so let's say that we are then told that our cost of our item is nine pounds we do nine pounds times 40 over 100 360 isn't it to get our profit we can do nine pounds times 140 over 100 nine it's late i know i shouldn't be using a calculator 1260 and always check nine pound plus 360 1260 sure enough so we can actually be given any of those even if we were given what if we were told that the price was let's say the price was 
32 pounds. We can convert the price into either of the other two. So we can say the price times 40 over 140. Can you see we're using different percentages? 32 times 40 divide 140. Didn't pick my figures very carefully. That would give us um, 914. We can then do, should have started in green, times 100 over 140. 32 times 100 over 140 gives us 2286. Do they add up 2286 plus 914? Yes, 32 pounds. Let's check it the other way. 2286 times 40%. 914. You can check it every which way. So what we're doing all the time is we're using the pairs of ratios. And we can move, given any two of those, if we know the price is 140, the cost is 100, we know the profit is 40. If we're given that the price, if we're given just that the price is 140%, we know the others are 40 and 100. We can have any one figure of price, profit or cost given, and we can use that to get all of the rest. Not too different, really, a margin. We're using the price as 100%. So that means that let's say we're operating on a profit margin of 25%, say. We now know that the cost is 75% of the price. So as long as you get your 100 in the right place, you can't go wrong. So let's say this time we are told that our cost is £27. If we do times 25 over 75, that's a third, isn't it? 27 pounds, that's nine, nine pounds. If we do times 100 over 75, we get 36 pounds. Always test it, 36 pounds times 25% is nine pounds. 36 less nine is 27, 27 plus nine is 36. Hey presto. Um, let's work the other way. What if we want to work from a price? So let's say that we are given that our price is 82 pounds. Times this time 25 over 100. So if we want to convert to a profit. We use the 100, we use the 25. That's 20 pounds and 50 pence alternately times 75 over 100 it's going to be 61.50 isn't it 61.50 plus 20.50 is 82 that is 25% um, is 20.50 25 70 fifths one third of 61 it is once again you just take the appropriate pair to convert from one to the other and when you look at it that way that's not so bad really is it and that is a mark of a margin is a perennial achilles heel but i've heard complaints about for years and years and years um when I was a student, the person I used to um, catch books off, because I used to forget to take books, I don't know what lesson it was or anything, it was brilliant, she could do everything. Well, final accounts of the lot, got it all just like that. Couldn't do markups and margins to save a life. Um, and I first developed this technique, or take 
Here's how I do it. Here's how I do it. Look at this. Look at this. So there we go. Final thought before we look at some more exercises. Reasonableness, reasonableness of figures. Calculators are our greatest ally, but they're sneaky little horrors because your calculator will cheerfully give you the most nonsensical answers by allowing you to bounce a zero or miss a zero. Um, so what is vital always, never ever accept what your calculator tells you just blindly. Have a bit of a think. Um, we say here, think about whether figures are reasonable given other numbers you know, um, and ask whether the figures are sensible. This might be figures quoted to you by a client, but this is in a broader context. But I'm particularly thinking now, um, in, in our context, of, of what comes out of the calculator. If it's important to check reasonableness, if a transaction has been coded incorrectly or posted inaccurately, it can lead to errors which need to be identified. Um, and I've just jotted out some numbers earlier when I was thinking about this. So let's say that we've got a sales figure of £800,000. Well, it's not a, too small a business, but not a massive business. And we've worked out our gross profit and our net profit. And we've calculated that we've got £400,000 of gross profit, £100,000 of net profit. That's reasonable enough, isn't it? Half, eight, 800, half of that, 50% gross profit. Yeah, it's plenty of businesses make a good, good margin on what they sell. It's a perishable item, they have to sell them fast. Could well be. Net profit, well, decent chunk less for expenses. That's fine. Okay. What if the figures we got were 300,000 gross profit, 200,000 net profit? Well, that's a not quite such a good gross profit, but it's still perfectly believable. Three eighths, 37, 35, 40%. Right, that's acceptable. Net profit, 200,000. That's that's only 100,000 expenses. Um, but of course, there are two ways of running a business. You can have the premium product where you have to have all of the support and all of the staff and all the premises and that spend a fortune on expenses. Or you can be the discount warehouse where you've got hardly any staff. You pile them high. People come in, they've got to get their own boxes off the shelves and cart them to the till. So if your expenses are very low, that's not impossible. What if we had a gross profit of 180,000 and a net profit of 190,000? Anybody see a problem here? 190,000, that's not much different to the 200,000 that we thought was reasonable a minute ago. Do we think something in this set of figures? Anybody, anybody got any thoughts? Well, my thought is, for a start, you can't make more net profit than gross profit because gross profit is net profit minus expenses. Yeah, the net profit cannot be greater than gross profit. Absolutely. The figure I'd most likely suspect I've written down wrongly here is probably that one. Because the net profit in itself doesn't look too bad as a combination that has to be wrong. Absolutely. You can't have negative expenses. <laughs> much as much as there are people who would like perhaps like it you can't get your staff to pay for the privilege of coming to work <laughs> that only happens in uh, that only happens in comedy sketches um i'd suspect maybe i've written the gross profit down you know um but i would check both of them what if we get gross profit of nine hundred thousand? And net profit of 500,000. Once again, now this time, you can't have more profit than sales. You can't make a greater amount of gross profit than the total you sell, because even if you get your product for nothing, then you've got 100% gross profit. You can't go any higher than that. The net profit might be reasonable, might not. 
just a couple more. What if our sales were 2.5 million, a little bit bigger organization this time? And we think we have gross profit of 700,000, net profit 250. I'm happy enough there. They're reasonable, aren't they? That's that equate to 10% net profit. That's a decent return in today's conditions, but not utterly inconceivable. Same net profit, but we report a gross profit of 150. Plainly, somehow or other, that can't be right, can it? because we can't make a lot more net profit than gross profit and a gross profit of 150 in 2.5 million um that equates to what six seven percent gross profit um that that's highly unlikely to be right we we're looking for figures that feel reasonable so if we have a gross profit of 1.4 million a net profit of 7,000. Whoa, what does anybody think to this one? Anybody think that has to be wrong? Well, to be honest, you would certainly check it, but you may have heard that there are plenty of businesses who've got net profit in brackets at the moment and losing money. So actually, that is perfectly possible um, and unfortunately too common at the moment. But having said that, that is one heck of a drop, isn't it? That's a huge drop from a very healthy gross profit. So I would certainly want to investigate um, that perhaps some of my expenses um, so somehow or other. I've, I've got gross profit costing my expenses because that's a heck of a difference. But the very low net profit, sadly, is all too achievable uh, nowadays. Finally, 300,000, 290,000. Possible, yes, not impossible, reasonable, unlikely, unless you are selling a product at an incredibly low margin selling an awful lot of them um, and you have got almost no costs so you know we'd probably we'd want to have another look at the at the gross profit there so again it's reasonableness and the thing that you do is double check if it's a calculator I would always guesstimate. If I'm asked to calculate uh, 736,527 times 32.5%. Okay, lots of digits there. Here's what I do. I say, well, that's about a third. And that's about 750. And a third of 750 is about 250,000. So when my calculator says to me, two point four million, I know something's wrong. What I did there, I bounced, I bounced the seven at the end. Whoa! And yet, I kid you not. I've seen plenty. I was an examiner at one time for one of the bodies, and I've seen exam papers come in with answers like 32.5% of 736,000 is 2.394 million pounds. So about 750-ish, about a third. So about 250 we're looking for. And of course, the, the proper answer is 2.627. Two three nine three seven one. So we say two three nine three seven one against oh, and twenty eight pence against our guess of two. Is that reasonable? Yes, I'm happy with that. 
more than happy with that because it's about what we would expect that little test it's you know you don't have to be a genius for mental arithmetic you just round you know if it's 986,000 you say that's about a million you know and if it's 18.123 percent oh, that's about 20 so it's about a fifth of a million it's about 200 a little bit less than 200 you can be very approximate but you know the pretty much the scale of the answer you're looking for and that protects you against missing a digit or bouncing a digit which say your calculator much as we love our calculators it does have a sense of humor your calculator will make you look silly if you give it half a chance Okay, so reasonableness, reasonableness in terms of accepting what you're given reason from either from a client or from a source, reasonableness in terms of what your calculator is telling you, which is probably the most likely thing that's going to trip us up in our present context. Okay, sample task. Now we'll see who's listening. Complete the following working to calculate the markup. Markup percentage and we've got a choice 100 market percent is 100 if only market percentage is sales divided by let's not guess we have cost we have profit we have price cost is 100 so let's say our profit is 20 our price is going to be 120 so it is our market percent is our profit divided by our cost of sales yeah well done yeah excellent um again I'm, I'm very visual in my understanding of, of most things i looked I, i'll confess i hadn't bothered to look up the model answer to this and yet i looked at that and i thought oh laid out like that it's confusing so what do we do put it in the box it's oh yeah of course it is it's profit over of course it is um notice this the the little test there gross profit net profit we're always talking gross profit against sales when we're talking market and margin but there you go in an exam your brain will turn to cheese um, and a question like that can easily easily cost you a couple of marks draw yourself a little picture make sure they give you scrap paper for your exam they should do make sure you've got plenty right Let's find another task. Okay, so we've got our next one. Ah, now this one is using the cash in the bank account. Helen Jones has a small shop. She is provided with transactions about June 20x4. Okay, so our job is to find out how much money has gone into Helen's pocket. Um, and small shop owners <laughs> how notoriously bad at remembering how much money they've really had um <laughs> my grandma had a sweet shop well, i was too young to learn accounts at the time but i remember it well um okay so in our cash account well first thing we need to find is how much we had at the start and um, we are indeed told the till always holds a float of a hundred pounds so that means at the start of June X4, there was a hundred pounds in the till. That's a start. Okay. Now, what are we told? Oh, we're given till rolls to show the amounts paid into the till. So, um, but, 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 um I suppose we're going to call that cash sales, aren't we? Which are 12, 8, 5, 4. And here's a tip. Let's cross them out as we do them. That'll avoid any confusion. 
Um, but um, but um. Total of cash vouchers, expenses paid directly from the till. Oh, actually, the top one's also out of it. Paying in slips paid into the bank. So out of that till, we have taken 6,238 and paid it into the bank. We've spent. What's that now? 3,616 on expenses checks paid the payables well checks don't come out of the cash tills so we don't worry about those do we the figure that we are looking for she's taken drawings from the cash till Ooh. so that's the figure we don't know drawings and from the bank account okay well we'll worry about that in a minute one other final figure, the till always holds afloat. So that also means as well as having an opening balance of 100, there'll be 100 left in at the end. So to balance off, quick glance, 12, nearly 13 that side, six and three, about 10 that side. So the big side is the debit side. 12, nine, eight, four. Okay, look. Nine five for oh dear. Nine five four. Transfer it across. Can't get over the next bit. Twelve nine four. Two four So we take off 62.38, we take off 36.16, and we take off 100, and we are left with, ooh. Oh, an exact 3,000 pounds has gone from the till. Okay, so that's the first part of our, that's the first part of our answer that we're looking for. Now then, the bank, aren't we told how much was in the bank at the start? had a balance of 214 pounds um might have been more helpful if it said had a positive balance or said that there was 214 pounds in the bank um it doesn't say that it's a negative balance so i think we can take it that in the absence of a very specific instruction bank <laughs> talking right at the same time balance brought down so we're starting with 214 pounds in the bank we know that we paid into the bank that amount didn't we credit the cash debit the bank six two three and eight we are told checks paid to payables come out of the bank four one two zero finally so we've done that one and again six eight three on the 13th we're not told that it is overdrawn by six eight three so we'll make the assumption that that's how much is in the bank and in between drawings obviously go on the credit side to take money out the bank because if they were on the debit side they wouldn't be drawings six and a half on the debit side four a bit under five so once again the debit side has it the eyes have it <laughs> 60 two we take away from 64 52 41 20 683 so one six four nine she's paid for her holiday so total drawings we've got to add the two together well that's easy isn't it four six 
four, nine. Now I looked at that exercise when I was prepping up for today. And I thought, oh, there's a lot to do there. But actually, if you're methodical, oh, what didn't I do? Didn't cross that out. No, so everything's crossed out, isn't it? We did that one twice. Yeah, we've right, yeah. We were methodical there. That's not too bad at all. Okay, what else have we got? We have information about a sole trader, Sandy Hamper. <laughs> That's what you get if you have a picnic on the beach. Oh, sorry. We have to establish his assets, his liabilities and capital. And what I do here, <laughs> motor vehicle. Is a motor vehicle an asset or a liability? There is a joke here. It's an asset as long as you buy the right one. Because we've all had one of those, haven't we? I've had a couple. Computer equipment, that's an asset. Inventory, stuff we've got in the warehouse to sell, that's another asset. The bank is a credit, ooh, credit balance on the bank statement. So the bank statement says, the bank are saying, we owe you some money. So that's another asset because the bank owe us. Yes, if the bank statement, remember that the bank statement is not our bank. Our bank account will therefore say debit. If the statement credit, the bank are saying, we owe you. Crikey, too quick for me. We owe you. Trade receivables, people who owe us money. They're also an asset. Payables are a liability. So we've got five assets and a liability. So 6,200 plus 1,200 plus 654 plus 1,230 plus 8,220. So our assets, 17,504. Ooh. What's missing from 16,200? Ah. Uh, liabilities. It looks like that that bank has caused a bit of confusion. Yes, yes. It, this is this is the key word statement, bank statement. So difference between the two eight oh nine two. Here's our bank account. We've just put a thousand pounds in the bank. This is us. And here's the bank. What does a bank look like? Uh, it's got to have a posh door, isn't it, on a bank? Windows, okay. Here's the bank. We put a thousand pounds in the bank. So to us, asset to the bank, liability. Much as they won't be happy about it, they'll have to give us it back one day. So they owe us a thousand pounds. Hence, the bank produces a statement that says, I owe you a thousand pounds. In the eyes of the bank, that's a credit. So a credit on the statement equals a debit in our account our books of account uh, always have to read any data regarding the bank very carefully very carefully okay Ooh, some more markup and margins sandy operates a gross margin of 20 percent Price, profit, cost, that's 20. Margin, therefore the price is the 100, so the cost is the 80. Sales total 72,600. So 726 times 0.8, 58. 
0.0080. Gross profit for the year. Well, that's going to be 20% of the price or 20 80ths of the cost. Do it either way. Fourteen five two zero. The thing I really like about yep, spot on Carol, about laying out a table like this is it forces you just to slow down, think logically, uh, and avoid the easy confusions. Now Oh, purchases for the year were 59,750. What's the value of closing inventory? Uh, well, we're not, we didn't have opening inventory on the previous page, did we? This is another, another task. So, are we given, are we given, are we given? So if we have bought 59,750 and used up 58,080, the, the, the movement in our inventory is 1,670. That's how much we have got left out of what we've bought. Yes, yes, I'm using price for sales. It, it's either the price of an item, or it's the, or it's the, or it's the, the value of sales. Thankfully, profit and cost kind of work for an item or for a total, don't they? So, I can't see that we're given um, an opening inventory unless i've not oh this is sad yes we had 654 at the start plus 654 that we started with so we must have left at the end two three two four actually that's going to be rather neater if i Put that there. Opening inventory. There. There we go. So we have two, three, two, four. The closing inventory is compared to the results of the year end inventory count, and your calculation is greater than the physical inventory by 625. So we've only got we can only find 1699 in value in the in the um, in the warehouse. So how could this happen there is less in the warehouse than there should be if we count something twice well that would cause an increase so we can discount that the non-current asset register has not been updated non-current assets are not inventory inventory relates only to goods bought for resale so that is no effect some inventory had been taken by the trader for private use, which will reduce what's in there. This has not yet been recorded. Now, that's, a, that's a looking pretty possible. The depreciation charge is nothing to do with inventory. 
So it has to be that our trader has taken some inventory. So we've got one more question. Oh, update the value of closing inventory, which we've just done. It's now going to be 1699. And where we're going to post it for a bonus point, of course, drawings. That's where 625 has to go. Remember that drawings doesn't have to be cash. Drawings can be anything of value in the business. And it wouldn't be an AAT question without a sprinkling of ethics, of course. Now, this is an interesting one. Because I, I've mentioned previously talking about ethics, there's always overlap. So looking at this, see what threats we can see and which principles they relate to. Because I think there's an argument that possibly more than one of these is, is um, relevant. You've been asked to check a report that a colleague has produced. The manager says she's double checked it. It's absolutely fine. Don't don't faff about. Don't waste time. Just just sign it off. I've double checked it myself. Um, and, and if you're happy to do that and save me some, I'll buy you a drink. Oh, buy you a drink. What's the first? What's the threat? If someone says they'll buy you a drink. Assuming you like drink. Self-interest. Oh, hey, there's a drink in it for me. Woohoo. Self-interest normally would point to integrity. And a little bit of objectivity as well, because you shouldn't be thinking about your own gains. You should be thinking about the two and four. Ooh. <laughs> OK. What other threats can we see? It's our manager. How many people here are keen to argue with the manager? Uh, manager says do something. Don't really want to get on the wrong side of them, do you? And if it's the manager and you're a bit, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Carol. Intimidation. So again, that's the type of threat. And that really is objectivity, mainly. You could say it's because you don't want to lose your job. You don't upset them. Therefore, um, you, you perhaps would, would um, also say there's a bit of self-interest there, a bit of you know, personal gain. Um, the other threat is that plainly you, your manager is not a stranger, nor is the colleague. You know them. Yeah, well, yeah, she's all right. My mate in the other office, yeah, she knows what she's doing. She's pretty good. You can depend on her. And if you start thinking, oh, yeah, it'll be fine. It'll be all right. That's a familiarity threat. Again, that would point to objectivity, because although you don't really want to fall out with your colleague, you haven't got a lot to gain by going along with it. I can't really see a pointer to professional competence, um, if I'm honest. Integrity, I can see a little bit because of the, certainly the offer of a drink makes you think, ooh, mm, I'm, I'm, I'm confidentiality. There's no suggestion here, so we can, we can dismiss that one. There's no real suggestion that it's our work that's in question. Integrity, there's a little bit, not really fresh competence. The big one is objectivity, because we can see three separate pointers to it. That's how I would analyse a question like that, because, again, it's so easy. Look for the threats. If, you know, if, if, if there's always more than one, there's very rarely a black and white answer with ethics questions. Look for the threats, you know, and, and, and really there's quite a lot of pointers to objectivity there. Wouldn't be, wouldn't be complete without at least one ethics question, would it? Well, thank you for your time tonight, everybody. That, that concludes the session and I shall now uh, stop the recording.